Um, so I'd like first to, to mention the, the title I gave to my presentation in this, to this program, which is A Collection of Is in Reverse. This is a particularly awkward title, and I was going to say intentionally awkward, uh, but that would not be exact. There was what was intentional was to keep it as such, because I found this very awkwardness puzzling. Its first part, a collection of is, is the oddest one. It is a translation into English of a title of a volume of poems just published by the Brazilian video artist and writer Katia Maciel at the occasion of an exhibition of her recent works in Sao Paulo to which she gave the same title, Colesao de Eus. You might notice that I added an indefinite article to it, a collection of his, hoping it would reduce the clumsiness, which of course it doesn't in any way, since the problem lies with the conjunction of the plural form S and the superlatively singular I. In attempting to translate Marcel's title into something less inelegant, one could opt for collection of egos or collection of cells, but that would entirely miss the point, which is that it is the uttering subject I who utters I when speaking or writing, and not its objective description, such as ego or self, that is serialized and collected. It would be a bit like translating Rimbaud's famous je est un autre into I am another, instead of I is another, which is the exact translation as a grammatical as the French original. <coughs> For the great French linguist, Emile Benveniste, there was no concept of I, since <coughs> each time this word is used, it refers to the subject who actually speaks or writes, or to use another linguist vocabulary, that of Roman Jacobson, it is an empty sign, a shifter. But in his discussion of the personal pronoun, Benveniste distinguished two modes of existence of I, as subject of the enunciation and as subject of the enoncé. Unfortunately, the distinction between enoncé, what is said, and enunciation, the act of saying it, has not found, as far as I know, its proper rendering into English. To speak like Philippe Lejeune in his 1975 book devoted to our topic, autobiography, Le Pacte Autobiographique, let us say that autobiography as a structure is characterized by a collapse of the two levels of discourse into one, by the identification of the subject of enunciation with the subject of the enoncé. I quote Lejeune. Thus, if someone says, I was born on, and gives a, a date, the use of the pronoun I results through the articulation of these two levels in our identifying the person who is speaking with the one who is being born. But then, is the baby who is born in certain sort of clinic in an area of which I have no memory whatsoever really the same person as me? Katia Maciel's odd title very economically highlights this very issue. One could call it an illusion, which is probably at the core of my inveterate misgivings about autobiographies in general. It explains why I've read very few of those, while I'm on the contrary an avid reader of intimate diaries and correspondences between writers, and why I never thought of writing an autobiography myself. Until I realized, with the help of my publisher, that by simply gathering a number of essays published at different periods of my life, I had, in fact, produced one of sorts, called an oblique autobiography. I shall come to the circumstance that led to the publication of that little book, but before that I want to allude to the second half of the title of my presentations today, In Reverse, which is perhaps as enigmatic as the first. It refers to the order in which the essays and in the book appear. They are reprinted in the reverse order of the original publication. That is, the first text of the book, after a short introduction, was the last published. It was originally published only a couple of months before the book appeared, before the book was sent to the printer. While the last text in the book was the first published originally, dating from 1976, close to half a century ago. I have to confess that this reverse order came naturally to me. I was perfectly, it, it was a perfectly instinctive decision. I did not even think about it. Going back in time is what I did when selecting the essays, so it seemed to me perfectly logical to offer them in the reader in the same manner, to the reader in the same manner. Most of the essays are preceded by a short narration relating the context of their original publication, and while I did not 
did not reflect upon this while I was putting them together, it now seems to me that the reverse order was the best means of decoupling the I with doing the explanatory narration, the current I, from the various I's who had written the original text. I was, without realizing it, transforming a collection of essays into a scrapbook or an intermittent intellectual diary. Now, some words about the how the book came about. Three independent but conquering factors led to it. The first and most important was a colloquium organized by Reni Daston and Alina Payne at the Villa Itati, the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies in January 2018. It bore the title, that symposium, half English, half Latin, uh, of scholarly vitae. Over two days, 14 speakers, including myself and one of my co-panelists this morning, Leon Barkin, were invited to present an encounter with a text, an object, a person that had precipitated change in, uh, in their work and, uh, and perhaps even reoriented their scholarship. But in these talks, so much contextual information was disclosed that in effect the whole symposium surpassed the initial remit and amounted to an extraordinary collection of intellectual comings of age. It was, and still is, by far, the most lively symposium I ever uh, attended. That very fact played a major role when, a few years down the line, I thought of the book. If I was so fascinated to learn about the formation of scholars whose work I sometimes didn't know, as many different fields were represented, then maybe others felt the same. Maybe the very topic of the scholarly formation had a general appeal. The second factor, for the publication that led to the construction of that book, had to do with guilt <clears throat> over an unkept promise. For several years, I procrastinated, delaying the delivery of a collection of essays on, on non-composition in 20th century art that I'd committed to publish with the university press. There was always something much more urgent and pleasant to do than face the pain of having to reread my prose, and the project was abandoned several times. Having finally vowed to overcome my reluctance, I was sorting out which of my essays were worthy of being reprinted and under which specific rubric. Since I was at it, why not another volume on Mondrian, or one on post-American art, or one on Matisse? Through this process, I quickly realized that quite a few texts didn't fit into any of the categories around which I was imagining that I could structure a volume, and actually had nothing in common other than my own interest and developments. Something sometimes directly so, when they add an explicit autobiographical component, but often indirectly, as in the case of book reviews, or book reviews of books that had particularly been important for me, or uh, you know, obituaries. <coughs> in short, texts that were, before anything else, markers of my own formation, definitely not material for a traditional academic publication. The third impetus was the entreaty of my friends at a brand new publishing house called No Place Press, which I love the, the name of that press. Um, that is, it's not a traditional academic uh, publication. Just as I was contemplating uh, this pile of homeless essays, they solicited a, a book from me. This is when I began to conceive of a volume as a kind of involuntary biography, or an autobiography in disguise, a Bildungsroman entirely made up of pieces that I previously published and inconspicuously testifying to the role played by others, their texts or works of art, in the constitution of one's identity. Having adopted this device to approach the autobiography genre obliquely, I dug deeper into my archive and found more grist to the mill, while at the same time discovering, no doubt helped by the egotistic or narcissistic nature of this particular exercise, that rereading myself was actually not as distressing as I had always imagined. As an expected reward of perusing the entrails of my computer was to come across short pieces I'd long forgotten, but that often Offered, uh, that offered vistas to my scholarly vitae, even though there is nothing scholarly about them. I decided not to censure, but to wel welcome the heterogeneity they would impart to my selection. Given its parameters, the volume I had in mind could never be labeled an autobiography proper, since there were many important moments of, or turning points in my professional life about which I had published nothing. <coughs> 
Nothing gathered in the book reflects in any meaningful way, for example, the cultural shock that move, moving from France to the US represented, nor the eight years I spent at Johns Hopkins, nor following that my time at Harvard and then at the Institute for Advanced in Princeton. But it makes no sense to add things to a scrapbook after the fact. Even when perused in reverse order, the bits in a scrapbook are, are dated. I conceived of these essays as pieces of evidence testifying to the multiplicity of eyes over time, their divergence, or eventually, but only eventually, their conver retrospective convergence. The whole point of the reverse order, I realized in retrospect, was to avoid the evolutionary trap in which autobiographical discourse almost automatically falls. Rediscovering these essays in that manner, I noticed obsessions that had disappeared, others that remained. It is this open-endedness that I wanted to convey to the reader. Moreover, more, not only the various eyes who speak in this text will be all different, and the distance between each of them and the current eye would also differ, but one would only be able to perceive those different eyes indirectly through what they say in the text about others or about past events, sometimes doubly past, already passed at the time of the original publication of a text, as in the case of a book review or an autobiography, or, or obituary, sorry, and a fortiori passed at the time of its reprinting. One of the most ubiquitous codes of the autobiographic genre is the litany of influences, to which the author admits having been subjected during his or her life, and particularly in the formative period of his or her youth. It is a particularly effective device of the evolu evolutionary compulsion I just mentioned. From a solid standpoint of old age, the writer concocts a script in which influence are the rivulets that progressively feed the grand river of, of his or her mature achievements. Students who participate in my sem graduate seminars know how allergic I've always been to the very notion of influence, at least as much as, uh, as to that of precursor. An allergy, no doubt, and it is in itself an amusing paradox, uh, was influenced by uh, Roland Barthes, whose polemical declaration, I don't believe in influences, had warmed me up when I read it many years ago. The abuse of the notion by traditional art history, for which it had become a central mode of causal explanation, certainly played a role in my early distrust in the discipline. I, I could simply never find any heuristic value, for example, in thinking that Picasso had been influenced by anger. In my mind, the question worth asking was, why did Picasso feel the need to revisit Ang? And why, at, the, at that very moment, or moments, why, when did he do did so? And how did he change Ang, our view of Ang? What has always seemed to me preposterous is the implication of passivity of the influenced with regard to the influencer. That the notion of influence conveys and this connotation is passivity is less pronounced in English than in French, which is perhaps why I'm so sensitive to it. An influence is, is endured, subi in French, from the verb subir. One suffers from it. Barthes again came temporarily to my rescue when he stated that what interests us today is, I quote, not what the author or artist endures, subi, but what he or she takes or steals, prend, either unconsciously or at the other end of the spectrum, Paradically. I was not entirely satisfied by this remark in passing, not that I read the allusion to the un unconscious as a nod of approval to the implication of passivity that repelled me. The unconscious for Bart has, was anything but passive. But I felt that by zeroing only on the two ends of the spectrum, he was leaving out too many options in the dark. It is at this point of amusing that I found an unexpected ally in Andre Gide on whom Barthes wrote one of his very first essays. I say unexpected because Gide's assistance comes from a text written in defense of influences and of the influenced as well as of the influencer, that odious word that has now become the name of a profession. The next in question, text in question is actually a lecture that uh, Gide gave early in his career, in 1900, he was 31, entitled De l'influence en littérature, concerning influence in literature. Most of, his, of it is devoted to the anxiety of influence, famously analyzed by Harold Bloom, how absurd and paralyzing it is, and how and why to keep it at bay. But at one point, Gide addresses what, he would call, what we would call the summons, and other, like Althusser would call the interpolation. Influence, he writes, creates nothing. It awakens. Or, more evocatively, I quote again, 
I have read a certain book. When I finished it, I closed it, put it back on the shelf in my library, but there were certain words in that book which I cannot forget. They have penetrated so deeply into me that I cannot separate them from myself. And force, I'm no longer the one I was before I met them. Though I may forget the book in which I read them, though I may even forget that I read them, though I remember them only imperfectly, this is of little importance. No longer will I be the person I was before I read them. How can this, their power, power be explained? Their power comes from the fact that they have merely revealed to me some part of myself of which I was still in ignorance. For me, they were only an explanation, yes, but an explanation of myself. What I find the most interesting in G's account in his analysis of what he calls, is his analysis of what he calls the influence d'élection, the chosen influence. The example he gives is that of travel, but he could have given that of reading a classic. Excluding unfortunate ex exceptions, he writes, forced trips or exiles, we usually choose the country in which we want to travel. In fact, we choose a certain country for the very reason that we know it will have an influence upon us because we hope for, wish for that influence. We chose those very places we think capable of influencing us the most. When Delacroix set out for Morocco, it was not to become an Orientalist, but rather through the understanding he was more to gain of more lively, more delicate, more subtle harmonies to become more perfectly aware of himself, of the colorist that he was. So this is, has no longer to do with the myth of a one-way trajectory from the influencer to the influenced. Instead, it speaks of a click of sp or spark between poles. It evokes the idea of an encounter. It takes two to tango, and I conceive my oblique book, the biography, as an inventory of encounters. Thank you. <laughs>